God promises to lead the blind to safety and turn their darkness to light. A reading from Isaiah chapter 42. This text will serve as the basis for our meditation. The Lord says, For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But to those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Hear you, deaf, look you blind, and see who is blind by my servant and deaf like the messenger I send, who is blind like the one in covenant with me, blind like the servant of the Lord. You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. The word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, our life, our light, and our peace, fellow children of light. Okay, a little little bit of Christian calisthenics, a little show of hands, a little stretching of the arms. How many of you wear glasses, contact lenses, or other corrective lenses? Raise, raise, okay, all right, all right. You're all the smart ones. All right, how many, how many of you have been wearing glasses since you were a kid? All right, how many, how many when you became an adult? All right. Now, what happened when you put those glasses on for the very, very first time? Could you see clearly now? The rain is gone. You could see all obstacles in your way. I remember my grade school principal relating to me the first time he put on glasses. It was in second grade. And all of a sudden, he realized that the trees had individual leaves. Before, he thought it was a great big green, green glob. Did you have a similar experience when you first put on glasses? Many places in the Bible equate physical sight with spiritual sight. Our sermon text from Isaiah chapter 42 is one such instance. As we meditate upon those words, may the Holy Spirit help us see how to have a 2020 faith. But first, a little bit of background. Anytime you do a prophecy, you probably should do a little background. Let's talk about Isaiah for a bit. He proclaimed God's word around 700 B.C. He was preaching when the northern ten tribes of Israel who had forsaken the Lord, king after king, having them worship false gods, doing whatever their mind set, uh, whatever their mind put, set their heart on to do, And as a result of God's judgment, they were carted off into captivity by the Assyrian Empire, the world superpower of the day, never to be seen or heard from again. God then sent Isaiah to warn the two southern tribes of Judah that if they didn't shape up, if they didn't repent, if they didn't return back to the Lord, the Lord was going to do to them what he did to their cousins to the north. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah deal largely with such declarations of God's law. But God's people wouldn't listen, so God made good on his threats. The nation of Judah would be defeated by the empire that followed after the Assyrians, the Babylons, the Babylon Empire, and they were carted off to captivity in Babylon some 100 years later in 586 B.C., And yet, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah's prophecies take a different approach. For most of of that second half, the rest of the book deals with God's gospel. Now, before 
he would mete out his judgment on God's people. Remember, this is even before they've been carted off into captivity. Before that even happens, God has promised to rescue his people and deliver them. In the second half of Isaiah's book, Isaiah, uh, the Lord assures God's wayward people that while in exile, they will, return into the, they will return to the Lord, and the Lord will return them from exile back to the promised land. God pictures this mass return from exile, something that had never been seen before in the history of the world, as if a blind person could finally see and experience their surroundings with the sense of sight for the very first time. God makes this promise in our text. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Fast forward 700 years to something which is normally impossible suddenly becoming possible. Jesus heals a man blind from birth. But what is more extraordinary than that, not, is that not only that the man could see for the very first time with his eyes, but soon after that, he could see his Savior for the very first time through the eyes of faith. But Jesus was not only a miracle worker for that blind individual. Fast forward to it today. Jesus is a miracle worker, the miracle worker for you. The picture on the screen is that literally watershed moment from the 1962 movie, The Miracle Worker, starring Anne Bancroft and a young Patty Duke. It's based on the real life story of Helen Keller. At age 19 months, little Helen contracted some disease. Many think it was scarlet fever. It left her blind, deaf, and unable to talk. As Helen grew, she was considered a bright but spoiled and strong-willed child. Her parents trying to find, seek answers on how to quell her, how to, how to teach her, how to make her a better individual socially and physically and emotionally saw even the advice of Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, and a proponent on teaching the deaf. They, he suggested the Perkins Institute, who then sent Ann Sullivan, 20 years old, to teach six-year-old Helen Keller, the strong-willed, wild child. At first, Sullivan would spell out words to things, but on that hand, she, she didn't grasp it. It's only until what this picture depicts, pouring some running water from that hand pump and spelling out W-A-T-E-R in Helen's hand, that it finally clicked. Now Helen understood what was meant by all that, that hand, those, this finger spelling and putting her hand on her teacher's mouth and throat to get the vibrations and see where all those words were coming from. They were actually words. They were equating the two. And Helen learned fast. With the teacher's help, she went to college at Radcliffe and graduated with honors in 1904. Helen Keller became a public speaker, author, and advocate for the disabled, for racial equality, and for women's rights. Like Helen Keller before her watershed moment, we too were stubborn, selfish, totally blind to the light of God's grace and completely obliv oblivious to God's will. How does Luther's explanation to the third article begin? I believe that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But then it continues with our watershed moment. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. For most of us happened, for most of us, that happened not when water was poured over our hands at a, at a hand pump, but when 
Our pastor poured three handfuls of water over our heads as a baby and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But for some of us, for the rest of us, it was when we heard or read the Bible and then that thought and idea that Jesus is our personal Savior from sin, death, and the power of the devil, that finally clipped click that became real to us. Now it had a deeper meaning, as if the gates of heaven had suddenly been thrown open for us. Either way, you received the gift of faith. Through the power of water and the Word, you received the forgiveness of sins. Through the means of grace, you received new life and salvation. In those immortal words from the hymn, Amazing Grace, you once were lost but now are found, was blind but now you see. And so, my friends, the first step in having a 2020 faith is this. Praise your gracious God who opened your eyes to faith. And now the second step to having a 2020 faith is this. Heed God's warning so that you don't become spiritually blind. God had some very stern words for His people in the second half of our text. He had stern words for those people He would free, whose eyes He had opened through faith. The prophet Isaiah records these words of the Lord. Hear you deaf, look you blind, and see. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me? Blind like the servant of the Lord. You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. Despite the Lord doing everything possible as well as impossible to rescue His people, they still wouldn't see. They still wouldn't listen. They reverted, reverted back to their worship of their, their old worship of self rather than their worship of God, and they behaved like it. Tradition has it that God's people were so fed up with the prophet Isaiah constantly proclaiming law and gospel to them, constantly warning them to shape up where the Lord is going to punish them, that they got so mad at him and eventually sought him literally in two. And Isaiah wasn't the only one of God's prophets to be martyred because God's people had become spiritually blind. Fast forward 700 years to that miraculous scene in our gospel lesson. Somebody who had been blind from birth suddenly could see. Shouldn't there, everybody have been rejoicing? Shouldn't everybody have been praising God for the great things they had done? Oh, no. The religious leaders were mad at Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, and they were mad at the man for being healed on the Sabbath. And that fury would continue to fester against Jesus until they wouldn't just murder God's prophet, they murdered God's one and only son. Why? Because in an effort to achieve salvation for themselves and by themselves, by their own good works and by their supposed keeping of the commandments, they become spiritually blind to God's free grace and boundless mercy. Fast forward to today. The Bible is still the most widely bought book in the world. But how many actually read it? How many of us take 5, 10, 15 minutes a day pouring over passages from Scripture? Or do we just not have enough time? Or how about the rise of the fastest religious group of people today? They are known as the nothings because they call themselves spiritual but not religious. They don't believe in organized religion because they see too much hypocrisy in the church and in the church's members. I ask you, have we contributed towards causing a friend or family member to stop going to church because of some blatant hypocrisy and not practicing what we preach? Because of our lack of seeing Christ in others, no matter what their skin color or social status? Because of our selfish my way or the highway attitude? Or how about here at Salem? Do we believe that since our granddaddy founded this congregation, 
We get a pass on doing anything at church for the rest of our lives. Do we think that if we come to church just five times a year, toss a couple of bucks in the offering basket, or occasionally watch a service online that we're being a good and faithful Christian here at church? Or have we gotten mired down by church politics? Have we become callous to change because we haven't done it that way before? Have we become satisfied with things being around here being just good enough for God? Or have we become complacent because nothing seems to be happening at church anymore? My friends, all of those questions really come down to this. Have we become spiritually blind? If the answer is no, then I answer, try again. And if the answer is yes, then I'll say good answer because that's my answer too. So, now what do we do about it? First of all, repent. Repent that there are times you can't see past the end of your own spiritual nose, like God's people in Isaiah's day or the religious leaders in Jesus' day. Repent that you've been blinded by your own self-righteous thoughts and by your own work-righteous actions. Repent that you've lost sight for what is truly important in this life and in the life to come because you've been pursuing things that you think will make you important. And then once you're repented, and this is just as equally important, trust in God's full and free forgiveness. The God who can free an exiled nation can certainly free you from your guilt. The God who can open a blind man's eyes can most definitely open your eyes to once again having that simple childlike faith that completely trusts in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And the God who can send His one and only Son to suffer and die for all of your sins and guilt as well, and then raise Him from the dead to assure you that your sin and guilt are completely removed, well, then He can... sure and certain can restore you to a right and righteous relationship with Him. And how does one do that? Through God's Word. The last verse of our text read, it pleased the Lord for the sake of His righteousness to make His law, that's His Word, His will, great and glorious. My friends, take time with God's Word. Read, learn, and meditate upon it. Talk about it around the house. Discuss it with your church friends and your neighboring buddies. Bind it to your baptism. Connect it with Holy Communion. Grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that you won't become spiritually blind. So will we wear glasses in heaven? I have no idea. We'll find out when we get there. But whether we wear glasses or not, far more important is the truth that like Job, who knew that his Redeemer lives, we shall see Jesus face to face with our own eyes. In the meantime, however, as we still struggle and strive in this dark and dreary earth with or without glasses, through those eyes of faith, we can take these words of Helen Keller to heart. Keep your face to the sunshine, and you cannot see the shadows. Amen.